Hello friends, this will be our third video now on this topic of the night watch. And I want to talk today about governing the night. So Lord Jesus, I just pray that you will give me words to communicate what you've placed in my heart and that you, Lord, that you, Holy Spirit, you would convey your message, your plans, your purposes to those who are listening and watching in Jesus name. Let your word not fall to the ground. Let your word go forth and do its perfect work in the hearts of all who are here in Jesus' name. So um, I'm excited about sharing this concept, governing the night. And the, the key verse that we are basically launching off of is found in the creation account in the very first chapter of Genesis. This is Genesis chapter one, verses 14 through 18. And it says, let there be lights in the expanse of the sky. This is God speaking creation into existence to separate the day from the night and let them serve as signs to mark seasons and days and years. And let them be lights in the expanse of the sky to give light on the earth. And it was so. God made two great lights the greater light to govern the day and the lesser light to govern the night. He also made the stars. God set them in the expanse of the sky to give light on the earth, to govern the day and the night and to separate light from darkness. And God saw that it was good. And so that's going to be our key verse. We're going to jump off of that concept, but this is where this phrase is coming from that I'm trying to convey to you the concept of governing the night hours. Now, there's another passage, uh, very interesting in Psalm 89, that speaks of the house of David, right? This is um, David, as he's established, not only as king, but as God is promising that the actually the Messiah would come through the lineage of David and that David would never lack a man to reign on the throne. And of course, that ultimately spoke of Jesus as the son of David and him ruling and reigning upon the throne and then his people then reigning along with him. And so Psalm 89, in starting in verse 34, and the Lord says, I will not violate my covenant or alter what my lips have uttered. Once and for all, I have sworn by my holiness and I will not lie to David. That his line will continue forever and his throne endure before me like the sun. It will be established forever like the moon, the faithful witness in the sky. So the lineage of David is compared then to the sun and the moon. Now, throughout the years, God has frequently spoken to me um, prophetically about the church using the image of the moon. And it makes a lot of sense to me in my mind because we have this, the moon in the sky has no it has no light of its own. It simply reflects the sun, right? The church simply reflects the glory of the sun of Jesus Christ into the earth. So the moon has no light of its own, and yet it lights up the night. It reflects the sun and it shines into the darkness. As that passage in Psalm says, it's the faithful witness in the sky. Just like us in the darkness, we are that faithful witness of Jesus and his light. And so I hadn't spoken much about that to people, even though I would get these prophetic words about the church and the state of the church based on the moon or with images or visions with the moon. But I've found out over the years that there's many other people um, that have that same image and that God speaks to them about the church using the moon as well. Now, I don't have time to go into each of these 
scriptures and to read them individually, but I'll refer to them. I'll try to put them in the description of the video so you can do independent study on it yourself. Um, but Psalm 104, 19 talks about how the moon marks the seasons. And we read that here in um, Genesis 1 as well, that part of the job of the moon is to mark the seasons. Um, I'm gonna, going to look at Psalm 136. Now, this is, this is interesting. Um, psalm 136 is just a large psalm of thanksgiving to the Lord, but it's reciting God's acts, his wonders, the things that he's done. And so it comes back to creation and it talks about how he created. And, and specifically in verse seven, it says, God who made the great lights, the sun to govern the day and the moon and the stars to govern the night. So it comes back to this idea of the sun, the moon and the stars these heavenly lights were created to govern the earth. And so I'm going to talk about that actual word here in a moment. But Psalm 148.3 says the moon is to praise the Lord. Songs, Song of Songs 6 verse 10. In that passage, the beloved is actually compared to being as fair as the moon. Well, of course, that's talking about the bride of Christ, that she's as fair as the moon. And in Revelation 12, verse 1, we've got this other picture of the church, which um, is rather amazing and comprehensive, because in this picture, this woman that, you, that John sees in the heavens, she's clothed with the sun. Now, we know that the church, we are clothed with Christ. That's New Testament, right? The New Testament tells us to put on Christ as a garment, that we are clothed with Christ. So this woman is clothed with the sun has the moon under her feet and is uh, crowned with a crown of stars upon her head. I didn't even um, refer to the passage that talks about the, the wise ones being um, who are, those who are wise will be like the stars in the, in the sky and that they would lead many to righteousness. Those are those who, who are governing the night through the light that they provide in times of darkness, right? So there's many other scriptures that apply, but this word to govern is memshalah in the Hebrew. And, and I say to govern, but the reality is the word means rule, dominion, realm, or power, and it's a noun. In fact, the only places that I see this word in the Old Testament used as a verb, like it is here in uh, the first chapter of Genesis, that the sun is to govern the night. I see it used here. And then in that passage I referred to in Psalms, where again, it speaks of the sun, the moon, and the stars governing. That's the only place that this word is used as a verb. But this, this word means dominion. It means power and rule and reign, right? So, so, all of this brings us back to a passage we've already referred to several times, Isaiah 60 verses 1 and 2, arise, shine for your light has come and the glory of the Lord shine upon you. See, thick darkness covers the earth, gross darkness is over the peoples, but the glory of the Lord shines upon you. And then it goes on to say that even kings will come then to the brightness of your dawn. So this is the job of the church in times of great darkness is to arise and shine. So this is another uh, just practical application of how we see the moon as an image of the church, that the church arises and shines, governs the darkness, governs the night, right? So speaking of some things that, that you all know, okay, so I want to look at Matthew 16. And and just come back to this very familiar passage that um, we've all studied in depth. But in Matthew 16, let's see, where exactly shall we start? Jesus, of course, talking to his disciples, asking them, who do you say that I am? Peter gives the revelation, then you are the Christ, the son of the living God. And Jesus says to him, blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for this was not revealed to you 
by man, but it was revealed by my father in heaven. And I tell you, you are Peter. And upon this rock, I will build my ecclesia, right? We know that's that was the Greek word he used. There was ecclesia and the ecclesia was what? It was the ruling reigning body of citizens within Athens. That was the ecclesia of Jesus time. So when he said, I'm going to build a ruling reigning governing body of believers. This is what he was talking about. This was the first ever mention of the church. I believe all of you know this, but it's foundational to this concept here. And the gates of hell will not overcome it. I will then give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven and whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Now, of course, you know, again, the verbiage of that in the Greek is whatever you bind on earth will have already been bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth will have already been loosed in heaven. And so he says, I'm going to give you the keys of the kingdom. Now, before I jump into that too deeply, let me talk for a moment about how the moon, the physical, actual moon, right? How does the moon govern things? And it does. So the moon affects how many hours we have in our day. It affects um, the seasons, right? We, we talked about not only does the moon and the stars uh, and the sun mark the seasons, but the moon affects our seasons. It affects how many hours we have in a day. It affects the tides, right? So so the, the way then that the moon, and this is information from NASA, okay? The way that the moon affects our days, they actually said, NASA says that the days on earth used to be much, much shorter. Now, according to them and their calculations of how many billions of years or whatever we've had, they say that the, the days used to be six hours. I'm not sure, you know, whether that's accurate or not, but, but the reality is I think there's evidence that the moon, because it was closer originally to the earth, that it affected the spinning of the earth. And as the moon pulled away, that the earth's spinning slowed down and the days actually became longer. So it affects how many hours we literally have in a day. I'd say that is governing. There is a ruling of time. Okay, hang on to that. There's a ruling of time. Now it affects our seasons by stabilizing the earth upon its axis. So between the gravitational pull of the sun and the moon, the axis of the earth, the tilt of the earth is stabilized where it's at so that the seasons are, are divided up as we currently know them to be. If the tilt was different then those seasons, certain seasons would be longer or shorter. So it governs times and seasons. Is this sounding familiar to you? I'm just going to jump right in and say the Issachar the sons of Issachar in the Old Testament were those who knew and understood times and seasons and knew what men ought to do in light of those times and seasons. So we'll we'll talk about that a little bit more in a minute. And it affects the tides. It, the gravitational pull of the moon literally um, pulls upon the water, causes the tide to come in and then causes the tide to go back out when that gravitational pull is released. So what does that mean? Revelation 17 verse 15 tells us symbolically, and I don't have time to teach on the voice of many waters. We could dive into this. There's so many scriptures that backs this up, but symbolically in the Bible, when it talks about waters, it's talking about people. So in Revelation 17, 15, uh, the angel tells John that the waters that he sees represents peoples and nations, peoples and nations, right? So nations, Psalm 110, nations are raging. Why do the nations rage and the people plot in vain? Nations are raging. The church then, like the moon, is bringing stability. It brings a certain level of stability. Again, governing in the night hours. This is part of the reason for the night watch. 
Governing in the night hours, the church brings stability. It governs and interprets the times and the seasons that we're in and even helps to control and shift those times and seasons according to God's will. We'll break that down a little bit more in a minute. And it determines the rise and the fall of the waters. What does that mean? It determines the rise and the fall of nations and rulers. That's biblical symbolism of the waters. The moon, the church, is called to govern the night. I hope that's clear. So um, the moon and, and the stars are set in place to rule the night hours. So, okay, we now jumping back in then to Matthew 16. I will give you the keys of the kingdom. So let's talk about that for a moment. The keys of the kingdom, then you're going to bind and loose. But, but first, I'm going to give you the keys because you can't bind and loose without the keys. So let's... Let's talk for just a moment about prophetic prayer. The keys are what has already been found in heaven and what has already been loosed in heaven. And that is prophetic revelation. Coming back into Matthew 17, um, Jesus said to Peter, this revelation, this prophetic revelation that you have of him, Jesus, as the son of God, upon that, I will build my ecclesia. Then I will give to all of you, I will give to all of you, governing, ruling, reigning, body of believers, I will give to you the keys of the kingdom. The keys is the revelation and the understanding of what's already been bound on earth and bound in heaven. That's the prophetic. So <clears throat> oftentimes when you are in the night watch, you're praying through the night watch, oftentimes the prophetic is released in the night watch. And the reason for that, we'll get to in a minute, but I can't tell you how many times I'm saying to my leadership team, to those I'm um, teaching or speaking to, um, I heard this in the night watch. Prophetic words are often released in the night watch. Now, the key, those are the keys, the keys to the kingdom, but, but the keys hanging on your keychain, on your belt, aren't going to do you any good if you don't take those keys and do something with them, right? So that's prophetic prayer. You begin to, what is that? That's the heart, the mind, the will, the desire of God and what he has already done in the heavenly realms. And he wants to see now instituted in the earth. He gives that to you. That's prophetic revelation that you pray back to him in the night hours. You come into agreement with him and his will, his purpose, his intent. That is prophetic prayer. Okay. And so that's a level of prayer that the church has been moving into, um, coming into some revelation, but as a whole, the entire church were not there. Now, can praying the scriptures be prophetic prayer? It can. It can be prophetic prayer. I am all about praying the scriptures. I love praying the scriptures because it's the mind of Christ, right? But how do you know? Because there's a lot of scriptures in this book. How do you know which scripture applies to which situation? That comes through the prophetic revelation that God releases. Then that's the keys of the kingdom. So yes, praying the scripture can be, can be prophetic prayer, but it may not be if you haven't gotten revelation on what scripture applies to what situation. You have to be able to properly govern the rise and the fall of nations and kings and rulers. And in order to do that, you have to know what scriptures apply. What is the heart and mind of God for the situation that you're addressing in prayer? So that's prophetic prayer that is often released in the night hours. Now that then gives us the keys, what it is we need in order to bind and loose. Whatever has already been bound and loose in the heavens, then we have to bind and loose in the earth. That, that, friends, is apostolic prayer. So you can see these two have to work together. So prophetic um, revelation is often released in the night hours because and so that then apostolic prayer can be done. Typically speaking, I'm going to say this, typically speaking, that has to be done in the daytime. Now, I want to take you back to uh, a phrase that Jesus said, we have to work 
while there's still daylight because night is coming when no man can work. Now, remember the, the reason that I wanna apply this in this way, typically speaking, our congregational gatherings, those happen during the daytime, right? Now, I honestly believe that as dark gets darker, there's going to be round the clock gatherings of the ecclesia out of necessity to rule and reign in the earth because we need that. We can't take a break from that when there are other forces at work in the night. We have to be ruling and reigning and governing in the night hours. We have to govern the night. We are called to govern Isaiah 60. We are called to govern gross darkness, to shine the light into the darkness. So um, in this case, though, we have very few gatherings of two or more in the night hours. Now, that's all that's required by the scriptures, not only Matthew 16, Matthew 18, uh, Matthew 18, 18, I believe, 18, 19, anyway, right around there. That's all that's required in order then to bind and loose. Now, what that means is the verdicts of heaven, what we just talked about, the revelation is released and the congregation comes together, then Jesus says, I will be in your midst. And in that setting where you have two or more, and I have come and manifested myself in your midst, in that setting, you legislate. You then take the keys of the kingdom and you bind and you loose. <clears throat> okay, so it's Matthew 18. It's 18 and 19. I tell you the truth, whatever you bind on earth, will have already been, right, bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth will have already been loosed in heaven. And I tell you that if two of you on earth agree about anything you ask for, it will be done for you by my Father in heaven, because where two or three come together in my name, there I am in their midst. So this is a congregational, just two or three, but it's a congregational setting. Now it can be two or 3,000. But where we come together in the name of Christ, he manifests in our midst. Then we lay hold of prophetic word, prophetic revelation that has been released. And we then bind and loose. That is apostolic prayer. So you can see how prophetic prayer and apostolic prayer have to work in conjunction. You have to have the keys of the kingdom in order to bind and loose, right? And in order to obtain that, we govern. We govern in the night hours. We hear the heart of God in times of gross darkness in order then to go to work in the daytime and to apply those things in the night hours. So governing the night. I hope that um hope that was really clear. Um I'm I just love this picture and how even in creation that the Lord made it clear that he had created these lights then to govern to rule and reign in the earth and that that would be a picture of what he was calling his people to do in the end times so um we will continue this series i believe there's two more videos probably talking about the effects the results of what happens then when we step into our position in the night watch um to be able to hear the heart of god to come alongside of Christ in his place of prayer and pray along with him throughout the night hours. God bless you guys. We'll see you in the next video.